Hi everyone, uh, my name's Phil Savile from CIS and we provide IT support and cybersecurity solutions for small to medium sized businesses. Today I'm joined on the panel by Neil Lawson-Smith, the MD of CIS, and we're also joined by Erin, who will be asking the panel the questions raised by yourselves. So uh, give us away, everybody. <laughs> Great. So today I'm going to talk um, to a 10 minute talk on how the cyber criminals are upping their game during COVID-19. Um, we're going to open it up to questions for myself and Neil to answer. Um, so please submit any questions um, in the comments below. Um, and also even share some of the experiences that you've had relating to any recent cyber attacks or cyber threats. So I'm going to show um, share my screens. Um, so just bear with me. And we'll start the presentation. OK. So, how the cyber criminals are up in their game during COVID-19. And if you're watching this on a pre-recorded version um, after Wednesday, 29th of April, please still comment below and we will be in touch. Um, our aim today is to make you aware of the types of cyber threats happening. Some are new methods uh, and some are existing ones, but with a different spin on them. Um, and others are ones that have been around for a while, but unfortunately have been very successful for the hackers. So hopefully the next 10 minutes, um, the next 10 minutes will answer some of the questions that give them um, give you something to think about or give you the sort of chance to ask for advice and solutions and support from myself and Neil today. And of course, if you believe your employees would benefit from a free bespoke cyber awareness presentation, stay tuned to the end of this 10 minute presentation for more details. So how the cyber criminals are upping the game. There are three key areas that I'm covering today, starting with phishing. So with the increase of emails for day-to-day -day communication, the fake news around COVID-19 and businesses accessing more online news services, the hackers are using phishing emails to steal credentials, install malware and extract money from companies. The hackers are purchasing coronavirus related domains to create phishing websites and email addresses like the fake email here shown about the World Health Organization, which is asking you to click on the download where potentially malicious software is installed in the background of your PC. I read today that scammers are sending 18 million hoax COVID-19 emails to Gmail users every day so it's a real threat sometimes they target specific companies and with a bit more research by the hackers they can perform what's called a spear phishing attack of course when fake text messages are sent this is known as smishing taken from the phrase SMS phishing. So these texts would lure users to a compromise or fake website as shown here. And on average, 31% of people click on a phishing link in an email or text. And 17% of those people enter in credentials onto a phishing website. Then there's what's called vishing. And this is where calls are made to a target. An employee, for example, impersonating someone to obtain details that they can then exploit for cash. By targeting individuals on their own at home and adding some urgency to the request, dupes the, the person into handing over details they would normally check first. And of course, hackers can easily find out who is furloughed within a company and use that information on someone else. For example, hi, I spoke to John Smith before he was furloughed and he authorized, and this is all authorized. We have started to pro cite the process already, but just need this information urgently as the deadline is today. And the conversation would continue. Scary, I know. So we move on to our next area. <clears throat> So with the huge success, uh, sorry, the huge increase, shall I say, in video meeting apps like Zoom, House Party, et cetera, 
hackers have been taking advantage of the providers who were just not ready for the increase in use and sometimes the insufficient security measures. Zoom itself went from 5 million monthly activity users to 200 million in the space of six weeks. And just last week, Microsoft Teams, a popular collaboration tool, fixed a potential issue which had the ability for hackers to access all the data held within a company's team site. Users are also finding their own solutions and tools and using them without consideration to the risks, the authorization or knowledge of the company's owners. There was a recent incident where users created a public Trello board to share tasks and communicate, holding a spreadsheet of clients' data, which were visible to the world. Also, companies have been panicking about staff not having access to files stored normally on a device in the office. So finding shortcuts and high risk ways of accessing them, like moving the files to a cloud solution like Dropbox or Google Drive SharePoint and not implementing the correct security steps to protect unauthorized access. And hackers know this. Finally, out of date software. A good example of this is employees potentially at home using their own PCs um, that are being used for Windows 7 um, operating system. Let's face it, before they were hardly used at home because of smartphones and tablets, so they didn't rush to replace it. But now Windows 7 is not supported by Microsoft and hasn't been since January. So there's no security updates applied. And again, the hackers know this and will take advantage. Again, two days ago, Zoom released another update relating to their Outlook plugin. And Microsoft fixed the issue um, that I previously mentioned with an update. So making sure devices are up to date is crucial. And of course, while we're all at home, uh, leaving our core IT kit unattended in the office for the criminals to break in day or night and help themselves to the IT hardware storing the key company data on it. And potentially the only backup of the data is sat next to it on a different device to the server, which is also stolen. If that happens, it could be game over. And let's not forget GDPR. A GDPR breach can be caused by a single device which has lost, deleted or had stolen personal information on it. We have found employees saving files in multiple locations and therefore creating various versions of a single document. Companies then lose the ability to track where their, their data company, their company data is held. So hackers are well aware of all these vulnerabilities covered today and potentially use a combination to achieve their goal and by doing that maximize their return. So here's a few tips to sort of think about. Obviously make your team aware of phishing and spoofing emails that are out there. Keep devices up to date. Review security settings in new tools that are being used and obviously review the risks of where your company data is stored and is being stored. And of course, speak to us at CIS or, or your nominated IT support company to advise on the security solutions available that will reduce all these risks mentioned. And with human beings being the weakest link, why not take advantage of our offer. If you believe your employees would benefit from a free bespoke cyber awareness presentation for your company on a one or two of the areas that's been covered in more detail, why not contact us? Erin will add our contact details on the comments and at the top um, and we can hold a private 30 minute online webinar for you and your team free of charge with just a minimum of 10 attendees, up to however many you want. So thank you for your time so far. I hope you found it useful and it's given you something to think about. I'll quickly remove this presentation and Erin, if you could let us know if there are any questions, that will be great. Great, well, thank you, Phil, for uh, your presentation. That was really, really informative um, and we do have some questions. 
I'll just wait for you to get rid of your <laughs> presentation. Cool. Sorry. There we go. There we go. So we do have some questions that have come, um, that have come in for over the week from some of the customers that we've been dealing with. Um, I've got four questions to divide between you both. Um, and if anyone else has any questions or thinks of anything during this time, then do feel free to ask them in the comments and we'll try and give an answer to those as well. So, um, Phil, I'm going to start with you. Question one is, uh, I've received an email or text that I'm not sure is legitimate or not. How can I find out whether it is? Right. Uh, again, a really good question and a popular question. So there's probably, I don't know, five things to think about. Um, first one is, were you expecting it? Um, second is, check the external address that it's come from, um, as this may be what's displayed and what the actual address is may be different. And the easiest way to do this is just click forward on the email and then just scroll down to the previous email that came in and you'll see then the details on that. Third thing, I suppose, is um, hover over any links that are in emails, because although the text might say something, the actual link might take you somewhere else. So by hovering on your mouse over it, it will display it. Um, obviously, check for grammar and spelling. Um, you know, unfortunately, hackers sometimes get the odd word spelt wrong or it just doesn't read right. Um, so please just go through that. Um, and if you're still worried, don't click on the link and actually go to the website itself through your browser and then access wherever you need to do from there. So hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Um, Neil, for you, um, what is the most common cyber issue that you have and how do you recommend to stop it? Well, undoubtedly it's phishing, which is why we've put on the talk today. And we just want to make everyone aware that there are very active phishing campaigns by the hackers out there, and they are getting smarter, slicker. Uh, it's very easy to get pulled in on them. So that's that's kind of a very, very common one. Uh, people sending us emails in saying, is this real? What do you think? Uh, should, should, should I respond to this? And uh, people are getting smarter, but it's getting that awareness. So training is a really important way of making sure you stay on the front foot with that. Uh, the other one, it may seem a little bit obvious still, but we've got a lot of people out there with passwords and they use the same password for maybe their confidential systems as well as other places around the internet. And although they think it's sophisticated and, and it's uh, long and maybe got some characters in there, but because they've reused that elsewhere and maybe those sites get compromised by the hackers, uh, what happens then is, the hackers will then gather that information and try it all around the internet to try and break other systems. So the best way I can suggest people avoid that pitfall is to use different passwords for their sophisticated or uh, for their uh, confidential system, uh, sites and make sure that it's a different password each and every time uh, and not to share the passwords. Uh, do try and make them complex do try and use some characters in there. There are more sophisticated ways that we, we have available called two-factor authentication. That's where you've seen the, uh, sort of the, the, the keypads with the numbers, or more often now, you, you can have the same numbers on your, on your phones. A lot of that's free of charge, so that when you enter your password, you also get some digits typing at the same time. And they're only valid for a few seconds, and they can't be used elsewhere at the same time. So that's a really, cheap, good way of uh, giving you a really strong set of security that avoids some of the really basic hacks, which is phishing and passwords. So that'd be my recommendation. Okay. Um, Phil, uh, we've got another question that says, uh, is it safe to use free public Wi-Fi? Uh, again, an another good question. Um, the problem with free public Wi-Fi is you really don't know the configuration and the setup of it. So, you know, it could be Joe Bloggs in a cafe that's just created their own, or it could be a hotel. And again, you just don't know what the settings are. And, and, it, and you need to make sure that your data is, is not compromised. So my recommendation is, is, is definitely avoid where possible um, connecting to these free Wi-Fi's. Um, what you want to be doing really is using what's called a VPN, a virtual private network. Um, 
and therefore there it, it's all enclosed and there's you know it's, there's no sort of worries there worst case scenario is obviously on laptops nowadays you can connect to your mobile phone off the 4g um so you can use that but you know what you shouldn't be doing is is accessing data like banking and things like that when you're out and about and you're not you don't know the security behind the sort of the wi-fi that you're accessing and on the subject of uh, using like personal devices, Neil, how can you protect company data when people are using personal devices at home now? Yeah, obviously that's a very relevant question in today's situation with so much homeworking. And the security is certainly playing catch up and that's one of our biggest concerns as a responsible IT provider. So protecting your data at home, there's a number of things you can do. Uh, the company should be able to help you out by encrypting your hard drives so that any data there does meet GDPR compliance for security, but uh, making sure there's good backup, of course, that goes without saying. And within uh, Office 365 and other systems, there are uh, more sophisticated technologies called digital rights management. And that means that uh, your documents and spreadsheets are digitally encrypted to a very high level behind the scenes. And that worst comes to worst, if they go astray, they would be of no use to anybody else uh, automatically. So that's a really good way. Uh, and that's really, that's been something that possibly has been a preserve of financial services companies uh, who want that sort of technology. But I think now people are reassessing and saying, as we're now at home and the, the goalposts have moved where our data is, we've got to start thinking about these sorts of technologies. So there's definitely something that uh, you can speak to your, your IT provider about saying, you know, what additional security and digital rights management is there available to me that I can protect my information, whether it's in the office or, or out at home, I need to have peace of mind. Uh, even better, uh, we have a complete private uh, hosted cloud server technology, which means that the data never leaves the office. So that uh, you know, is a complete electronic ring fence around it. So anybody interested in those sort of new era uh, of, of working from home and making sure that there's complete peace of mind with digital protection. We've got lots of different solutions that we can offer. So to, uh, more than happy to take questions on that if people want to follow through with any specifics. Great, thank you for some really great advice, both of you. And um, we'll be doing the final installment of Phil's webinar sessions next week. Um, if you have any questions that you think of now or between now and then, then please do um, either message our page or send them um, to solutions at CISLTD and we can address those in the next video. And thank you to those who submitted the questions for this week as well. Before we end, I just want to mention Phil's offer again for a free bespoke webinar um, for cybersecurity needs. Is, is that right, Phil? Um, bespoke to your company, uh, absolutely free of charge, minimum of 10 attendees. And um, if, you, if, you, if you're interested in that offer, then just email solutions at CISLTD.com that email address will also be on the post for the live video. So you don't need to worry about remembering it or not spelling it correctly. So thank you so much to everyone who's watched and we're looking forward to doing the last session next week. Thanks everyone. Brilliant. Bye. Thanks guys. Bye. Bye.